the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. So, hi everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here and um, this is my first talk at the Polyglot event. And <laughs> Actually, I I wanted to give the first round of applause for the organizers. They have done, done a fine job for making this gathering happen and making it so appealing and nice to all language lovers. So. So, uh, before we start, I'd like to ask you, how many here understand German? Okay. Italian? Okay. And English? No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so, uh, my topic is living between different cultures. It's not something new, but uh, I think it's good to review some good old informations, and also the main scope of this talk is hearing your experiences also about this topic. So, a little bit about me. Um, io sono romeno, sono nato in Romania, e ho vissuto in Italia per dieci anni e cinque anni e mezzo ho vissuto in Ticino, nella parte italiana della Svizzera, e Uh, poi sono andato a vivere a Zurigo. Also jetzt wohne ich in Zürich in, uh, in der Schweiz und studiere als Multimedia Elektroniker. Nichts zu tun mit Sprachen, aber egal. Und um, ja, uh, so I, I started my language journey when I saw the video that Tim Donor did. I'm, I'm sure that many of you know that video. And uh, so actually he's a year older than me and I was quite impressed when he spoke 20 languages. And, um, and that's how I, I started to learn Arabic, then Persian, that, and then other languages that I never really studied, like most of us here. And um, by the way, how many here studied other, other things in college and university other than languages? Wow. <laughs> okay, so like half, okay. So it's not unusual. <laughs> okay. So let's get to the topic. Topics. We are going to talk about what identifies a culture, the problem of globalization, making contact with different cultures, and why is learning language is important. So, what identifies a culture? There are four aspects, which are language, costumes, traditions, and beliefs. These main four points. And the language is the most important of the four, these four parts, because the way we express ourself, ourselves also uh, reflects on the culture and maybe also on the traditions. But sometimes it's the other way around, because beliefs can affect, for example, beliefs can affect the way people express their ideas. Um, and also, although some languages may look alike, like let's say German and Dutch, their culture is uh, a bit different. So all, every uh, language has its own cultures, culture. But nowadays, cultures look a little bit alike in Europe and United States. Why is that? Why is everybody looking alike? Yes, there is a pro problem in globalization um, and the problem with glo globalization is that it's killing cultures. So let's analyze this concept. We live in a world that is becoming smaller and smaller. We can connect with people from uh, on the other side of the world just with a few finger movements. And we, when, when this happen, happened uh, with uh, many infor so much information that is coming, uh, circling around the world in different languages uh, we need a common language a lingua franca so, so to say so that people from other cultures other languages can communicate uh, but um, like like it was for Greek and Latin centuries ago now English has taken this, the place of most spoken language for business and if we think about that that is not unusual because 
just a, a century ago, England controlled uh, one uh, quarter of the world's uh, territories and one fifth of the um, population, world's population was under British rule. So we can see why English has become so popular. Having the possibility to communicate in instantly and in one language may seem pretty good, but we are forgetting other 7,000 languages. So if one um, or some are used, the others will, will die. And uh, globalization would be great if we would have like one language, but uh, unfortunately that's, uh, that's not the case. The scope of globalization is to enable easy business uh, using technology in that sense, but we have other 7,000 languages. So, um, what globalization actually does, instead of promoting all cultures equally, it just promotes the big ones even more. So let's make an example about that. In the world of business, we have uh, big companies, small companies, Big ones are competing with each other, and the small ones have to stay alive. And um, small ones cannot afford to create new standards, new technologies, because the customers are uh, relate to what big companies create. So uh, these small companies have to follow the flow, so to say, and uh, use the technology of big companies and use their information to make some money. So, what do you think it will happen when there is an economy crisis? Just shut it all out. What, do, what will happen to big and small companies? All of them, all of them fail at the same time. The small companies will be bought by the big companies. They merge from the big companies. So, yeah, big guys grow even more and the small ones have to quit the business. So this is actually what globalization does and this is an important point I want to touch with this part. Globalization promotes major languages and makes them grow but it suffocates minor languages. And, and the language as we've seen is an important, a very important part of what makes a culture. So by losing your culture, your language, you actually lose a big part of your culture. And now popular <coughs> languages are becoming even more popular because they enable easy communications uh, with, uh, between people and they're good, but mysterious and exotic languages are being uh, forgotten and suffocated. And so are their cultures. But there is a good side to globalization actually for us, language lovers. They bring more people to our city so we can study different languages and we don't have to travel. And it's about this contact. Uh, between people that I want to uh, focus my talk on. So making contact with different cultures. Nowadays we come in contact with many cultures and many people. So in Western Europe and America is not unusual to see, to live among uh, immigrant people uh, and this, is, this diversity is something that I like very much, uh, maybe because I was raised in countries where um, there were these cultures, and also because I myself am an immigrant, so I, cannot, I understand their situation. And who here has, is, uh, has been or is an immigrant? Someone that, well, quite a few, so yeah, you understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, so actually I live two types of immigration, the one where you can um, go to another country but still use your, your native language and the other one which is the most popular where you have to learn a new language to fit in society. So the problem is that for example with German I, I cannot um, use, uh, maybe make jokes or tell funny stories as I would do in Italian and someone is <laughs> nodding. <laughs> Because and that's, that can be frustrating because you you want to connect with people but there is this barrier. You're this boring. You're boring in that language. Yes, you 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 can be boring because yeah. you don't find the words and they have to wait for your uh, uh, what's that word? Uh, so <laughs> so uh, being an immigrant or uh, 
seeing more people coming in your in your country can be quite difficult sometimes, or let's say um, scary, S because uh, people can have two reactions when uh, when they see that more and more people are coming to their countries. One is to simply accept that the fact that yeah, okay, they are immig immigrating immigrating in my country. Okay, let's accept them. And the other one, uh, which unfortunately, is that they develop prejudices toward these people. So then. Why is language learning important? We have talked about globalization uh, and immigrants and what? Okay, so let's imagine that I'm, a, I'm the kind of person that starts developing prejudices early on. Like, I don't know nothing about, let's say, uh, Romanian people. And uh, I start developing these prejudices. What advice would you give me to, to let go of these prejudices? Meet Romanians, get to know them. Watch so, their movies. Watch their movies. Watch movies. Okay, so you touched more points. First, get informed. Get informed about their history, their culture, their uh, their food. Food is always good. Uh, their history and uh, their traditions, their beliefs. The second one is, as you said, actually talk to people and find out that they are normal people, like. They have their problems, their fears, their emotions. And the third aspect, if I would take it to the next level, I would be like everyone here. I would learn a language, their language as a mean to communicate with them, to make contact. And this is one important point that I want to touch, is that learning other languages helps us to understand the unknown and to accept accept other people and their cultures. So we, we, won't, we won't be afraid of the unknown anymore. So if someone would ask me, why do you learn languages, which is a common uh, question that we get, uh, I would say maybe immediately because I love them, they're cool. But um, on a second thought, I would say because I like connecting with people, making them happy. and. And, and this is, I think it applies to many of us here, connecting the, these connections, the, the, this community feeling. And I have two experiences actually. Um, one was in, when I was in the Italian part of Switzerland. Um, I, I started learning Persian casually and I would meet with Afghan uh, young men in my school that were learning Italian. And um, uh, at, at one point, uh, there was lunch and I came back from lunch and I looked on, on that floor I was searching for some some guys by but they weren't there and there was someone else and I wanted to ask them where are the others but the first phrases we exchanged uh, like greeting phrases were in Persian so, Salam, Cheturi, Choba, Merci and and you you should have seen the face of that person he was like so it, he was really happy and then he said, oh no, they're, they haven't come yet, but... Uh, so the, he, he became very, very, um, very nice to me because I was speaking his language. And then I had this, this great feeling of satisfaction. And, and the other um, um, experience I had was uh, in, in Zurich, um, I was in a bus. And the Chinese woman sat next to me, I, I thought it, she was Chinese, and then she was reading a, a little book, and I saw Chinese characters, okay, she's Chinese. And then I thought, okay, I don't know nothing of Chinese, maybe one word, but I'll say that. And as I left the bus, uh, I said goodbye in Chinese. So, if someone speaks Chinese, don't kill me for the tones. Zaijian, <laughs> and she, she was like, Zaijian. Amazed, because and and you know like uh, like Russell Peters said once, I have never seen an Asian guy open so much his eyes. So so and 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 then I got off the bus and I was like, ah, that made my day because I was uh, satisfied with one word I could um, make one person happy. So I want to show you now uh, this this feeling described by um, uh, Richard Simcott. In maybe you've seen this video, in a 
16 by 9 um, uh, video. If I can find the yes. So, audio. So he describes uh, in like nine seconds the feeling that this exact feeling that he has when he's speaking different languages. Oh, sorry. It's turned off here. Yeah. I hope Richard won't say anything if I use this. What it feels like to speak in a different language. God, it's amazing. I love it. I mean, I've never taken drugs, but I, I guess it's not a feeling, it's a drug. So, <laughs> it's a drug, yes. So, <laughs> I don't know if you can relate to this, but I've, I've, seen, I've seen this. I, I, I took a part, so to say, in this feeling, and I, I said, yeah, he's, he's right. So, um, in the words of Simon from um, the Omniglot, he said, Lang learning a language is a way to make connections with others. Even a few words, like the Chinese uh, woman, open doors, hearts, and minds. And the more you know of a language, the deeper and more meaningful those connections can become. And this is, and this is very true. Um, so learning new languages connects us with people instantly and uh, they, because they see that that even if we are not native speakers we, we, we have taken the time and the effort to learn their language and this, this make, makes them happy and also um, we can see that um, the time that we've put in learning even a few phrases and practicing our maybe our tones or our uh, for some languages and we've seen that the time we, we put in this work is actually paying off the time we put in this strange hobby and um, I also found this nice quote from uh, Jay Snyder for me I study languages to make the world feel welcome I want to reach over that gap and put people at ease. And this is actually what we are doing. We learn languages to make contact with people, but also because we want them to feel accepted, maybe in a new environment, like a new country. So doing this thi these things is not obvious, because otherwise everybody would do it. You need to have three major elements, being uh, open-minded, love people and love diversity and being open-minded is not something that you can find uh, pretty easily in, in today so I've seen for example in uh, also in Italy and also in Switzerland it doesn't matter every everywhere you go you see people that don't understand other cultures and make fun of them and this is actually not nice not and it tells and tells that these people don't understand, they're not open-minded, and if, if they want to change, it would be very, very difficult for them. So, uh, also, op uh, being open-minded strengthen uh, relations between uh, you and your friends, because even if you don't agree with what they say, uh, they see that you show them respect, because you're listening to them. So, as we saw, why is learning languages important? As we saw, learning languages is key to understand cultures, connect with people in an instant and happy way, and to become open-minded. Also, the more languages you will learn, the easier it will be to fit and to live between different cultures. Thank you. Now, I, because it was a short presentation and there was a scope, thank you Antonio, that's it. First of all, thank you very much, because, no. because uh, it was great listening to you and saying these things that opened my mind as well. Thank okay. you. And now if there's someone wanting to say something, 
not only questions, but uh, also I want to hear your experience with these. The, uh, I, I saw that someone was nodding, so yes, Alexandra. I'm actually question, um, questioning about your personal experience. Have you felt that acceptance the other way? Maybe people just finding out that you're either either you're Italian or Romanian, whichever, whichever it is they find out um, outside of Italy or outside of Romania, and then speaking to you in that language and you feeling, oh wow, that's great. I feel, I'm so happy that somebody, uh, not including obviously at this conference. <laughs> well, actually, yes, I, I felt this. Okay, also at this conference, but because I, I, I thought, okay, I'm here. Many people will learn Romanian, maybe. But also here, there were like five or six people that, including me, that, that spoke, that speak Romanian. So, also, like you, you said, in outside, for example, in Switzerland, you don't find, you, you, you can't find many Romanians. And whenever I hear someone, which is very rare, I'm like, I have to speak with them. Come here. So, um, and also, uh, here, when someone is learning my language, I'm also impressed because I know maybe Romanian is not so easy and it's also a minor language of Europe. So yeah, I, I, I feel this feeling the other way around also, also for, in my case. Um, yeah, it's probably something you'd be interested in. There's a few Irish speakers here in the room. Uh, my motivation to learn Irish came from that I'd already learned uh, Italian, I'd learned Dutch, and I felt deeply ashamed that I couldn't speak Irish. And so I was like a foreigner in my own country. So I, I decided just to try and understand my own culture, that I would relearn Irish. And I went to the west of Ireland and connected with the people in the west of Ireland and saw Ireland through different eyes, let's say, than just being a West Brit. As, yeah, you ever heard the expression of West Brit? That we use that in Ireland for someone who's more, if it, you know, has more of an affinity towards British culture than Irish culture. That's... Thank you. Irina? So first of all, thank you very much. I have to admit that what probably nobody saw was that I started tearing up when you said the Zaijian, that like, this is really powerful stuff and it kind of gets into me in it cellular level. Um, but I wanted to say uh, my experiences with um, what you said about uh, people discovering your own culture. Was that your question? <laughs> um, but um, living in Finland, uh, I don't think Romanians have the best reputation. I'm Romanian too, by the way. Um, and I was reading Metro, that's like an international localized newspaper, right? And um, this Finnish family or couple had gone to Romania, and it was like a little travel blurb uh, about Romania there, and, and they said that they weren't really, they didn't know what to expect, and then they went there and they had such a great experience, and they said that their whole view of the country changed. And I was really touched by that, and, and kind of, you know, just that you can find it in the morning newspaper, it was something positive, which you don't usually get from the news. So, um, yeah, just this, these things that can really move a person to do tears. <laughs> Thank you. In the back. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. There's a lot in it that resonated with uh, me, and I think a couple other people were saying that our personalities in another language that we're learning in a country we're living in are kind of boring, um, partly due to linguistic difficulties, but for me personally right now it's also cultural and the way people interact with each other. I'm from the U.S., but living in France. In the U.S., the way that we kind of get comfortable with people will show friendliness is by being very casual to them. Like someone you don't know on the streets, you're like, hey, how's it going? Or you make a joke. Um, whereas in France, at least what I've observed, there's a lot more politeness that you use with someone that you don't really know. And I, it's kind of preventing me from making closer friendships, I feel like, because I'm so like, okay, I'm French, I have to be polite. When I speak French, I have to make sure I, you know, I'm polite to everyone. But then I lose the proximity that in the U.S. I know how to deal with and I know how to navigate, but in French culture I don't. So I'm just curious to see if there's other people who've also navigated that experience before. Okay, nice. I guess I'm ready to Sorry, it's me again. 
Um, so I, I, I've had kind of not exactly the same experience in Finland, but definitely that the way you show certain things is completely different. And what really worked for me was that instead of focusing on people in general, like I had met a lot of people who I considered my friends, but I didn't see them so often, was sort of to just focus on a couple friendships that really act as kind of an anchor in the country that you feel like, with these people, I really belong. And then I find that that kind of ripples out with strangers as well, because you're not so like, come here, like stranger, I just need connection, you know? Um, but, but that you just focus on depth rather than breadth. Yeah. Um, quality over, uh, over quantity. Yeah, definitely. Quality instead of quantity, yeah. definitely. Um, well, while we're at it, why not? Um, I actually, was. this is my third country now, and um, I have the advantage that I was born in Argentina, but I was raised bilingual with English and Spanish, and so I moved to the United States, and I had absolutely no problem interacting with people linguistically, and I was pretty much aware of the culture because there's a lot of exposure in Argentina, like, like for movies and music and everything, is third no subtitled, I mean, excuse me, uh, they don't dub movies, they um, subtitle their movies, but there were still some things that I, I was not American, and I was living in the United States, and I was doing things like touching people, like, hey, what's up, you know, and just, just touching your arm while I'm talking to you, and this would put people off, and, uh, and this, or I will never forget, a friend of mine told me once, you're standing too close, and I'm like, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I said, could you please just back off a bit? And so these things, and then I came to Germany, and I moved here, and the disadvantage that I had is that I knew Guten Tag, and that's, that was pretty much it. Um, but little by little, as I, 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 did, I developed interest in people, instead of trying to get them to become interested in me, and, uh, and I started to focus exactly what you just said, on certain people and certain friendships, and develop the quality. And then little by little, that person introduced me to someone else, and then to someone else, and now I have the famous parties at my house where everybody wants to be a part of, uh, because everyone's so nice, and it's so friendly, and everybody feels welcome, and it's mostly Germans and a bunch of foreigners too, um, and the languages switch, but it's really nice, so you can make connections sometimes you just show more interest in other people, and, instead of trying to get them to, to like you. Yeah, which is. Mm, can easy. you still touch people? Um, uh, it, it, interestingly enough, I was, yeah, thank you. Interestingly enough, um, I'll, I'll tell a story, just a quick one. Um, but um, I, I will never forget. I, I was teaching. I'm a teacher, and I, I teach at companies. And there was this manager I was teaching, and she touched me. And what I realized, I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, is that I was put off by it, and I was like. Did she just touch me? Like, did she just put her hand on my knee while she was talking to me? And I'm like, she was not hitting on me. No, 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 no. She, she knows almost, so it was good. But, but I was like, really, seriously? Did she just? And I was a stranger in a str I, odd. But, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, it's not, um, there is a similar case, but it's not uh, really the same thing. I come from Colombia and I grew up in Spain, so we actually speak the same language. But I've always spoken Colombian Spanish to my family and Spanish from Spain to my Spanish friends. And I thought I didn't have prejudices. I remember at a party, I saw a guy that was like, uh, he looked really Spanish. I'm sorry, he looked really Colombian and uh, then he started to talk to me with a Spanish accent, and I thought, wow, this is really weird. And I thought he was not very nice. And at the end of the party, I discovered that he was Spanish. He didn't have anything to do with Colombia. So I thought, oh, maybe I have a lot of prejudices inside me. It's like, uh, so because it's the same language, and uh, we understand each other pretty well, actually. Uh, but um, yeah, I get some looks when I speak in Colombian Spanish, for example, when I'm in the metro or something. Maybe just curiosity is not... Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I might be in a different world when I speak Spanish. It's the same language, though, so maybe it's not that different. Yeah, even though that uh, language is maybe different, or slightly different, uh, people are, anyway, afraid of the unknown, so... What, you're not Spanish? Okay, you're something else. Even though you, you speak Spanish. So, yeah, I can understand your point. Um, I think back to the, this point of, of your experience in France and this idea of trying to make friends and not being sure how to do that. Um, I think that kind of speaks to how 
all of us, when we go to another country, we probably read things about, you know, cultural things you should or shouldn't do. And there's more emphasis on the ways that you might accidentally insult people. And the books never say, and here's how you can make friends, and here's how you can <laughs> properly um, make them like you. And, but I think that speaks really well to exactly the point of, the, of, of um, your talk, because you know, if you are if you are an immigrant or or an expat or some sort of sort of foreigner in another country, and somebody starts talking to you, they're giving you the opportunity to open up and make that connection. And if you do the same thing for for somebody who's in your country, or if you're also in another foreign country, but somebody who's an immigrant, you're giving them, you're saying, hey, you might be having a hard time connecting, and I recognize that, um, and you might want to reach out of your community, and I recognize that, and. Um, so here, here's a chance. Um, when I was living in France, it was the, I, I experienced that same thing where at first people, I was like, wow, this isn't working. How am I not able to make, to make friends? And I started talking to French people about that very, that very question and learned a lot about how, how French people make friends. We can talk afterwards if that's something that interests you. But, but you know, you do sometimes need that other that other side of somebody reaching out to you, and I think that's the benefit of all of us, is we have the ability to, to do that and say, hey, hi, there are people here who can help you come out of this, this shell of being a foreigner. Yeah, I'm, I've, I say always that I've never met a polyglot that is a racist. That would be strange, that would be... Well, it'll happen. It happens, but it's, I, I think it's really rare. Uh, usually, uh, a real polyglot, I mean. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so you explained the importance of importance on, and, and the nice thing about learning languages in different cultures, but I mean, outside the polyglot community, I haven't really seen people seeing learning languages as a tool to actually open up to people or understand cultures and all that. I mean, maybe this is a very small niche thing that the people in this community identify and understand, but it's gen it's definitely not a, a big thing out there. Uh, I'm an immigrant in this country, so uh, I've seen, I come from India, and I, I've seen Indians generally clock together as, as a cluster. They hang out together, cook together, eat together, whatever. I mean, they, they generally don't make attempts to uh, open up or learn language and all that stuff. And, and it's generally true with many other cultures, they just flock together as a group and, and learning, seeing to polyglottery as a tool to open up and understand cultures is generally not present outside this community. That's my observation. No, you're right because, yeah, I said it's not, it's not something easy to do, it's not something obvious to do, because otherwise everybody would do it. So, yeah, you need these elements, you need to, to be open-minded, to love people and also I'm, and love diversity, like, we all love diversity, otherwise we would have just one flag here. So, I, I understand your point, thank you. So, uh, this is more of a comment, and I just want to share my personal story about yes, living in different countries and my experience in adapting in different, to different cultures. Even in my own country, I'm in China, um, maybe in Europe and in other parts of the world, it's very common for people to not like each other, I mean, from different parts of the world to have prejudices. But in China, Chinese people don't like each other. And that's a very common thing. So it's like if you go to a different area, people don't like you if you speak with a different accent. So what I do in China is I feel like because I want to make friends <coughs> with people, I have this motivation that um, to, with whomever I'm talking to, my accent just drifts. So uh, when I'm talking to a northerner, I wrote a lot of R. Uh, and I start making a lots of nasal sounds, well, in the southern dialect, like you don't do. And when I'm talking to southerners, I try to like flatten on my R and get rid of the nasal sounds to, uh, you know, avoid the image being, oh, I speak cracked Mandarin. You don't, and that kind of thing. And I find it much easier to talk to people that way. And in other different countries, it's really different. For instance, in Germany, I was uh, living in Berlin for half a year last year. And, and I was just fine, you know, learning German and speaking high German. But then I registered in a local billiard uh, 
billiard for Ein Fair. Uh, well, in, in, in a local uh, billiard club. And there, there are like mostly people, you know, about 30, about 40. A lot of them are like originally from Berlin and East Berlin. So they speak with a huge Berlin accent or rather a Berlin dialect. And at the beginning, it was so difficult to understand them. And also, they drink beer. After a couple of beers, it's like, uh, alles ist unsauber, and das kann man so, so gar nicht verstehen oder sowas. So it's, it becomes all like that. But then it took me a while to get used to that. And then I developed for myself like a Berlin accent, a, a slight Berlin accent when I'm in the billiard club, when I'm playing with them. So I would drink a beer with them. Normally I don't smoke, but when they smoke, I just stand there and talk to them, bearing their smoke, and try to use their accent. And after like two months, uh, being the only foreigner in the club, they all liked me and they all played with me, and I was like a starter in pool game. And um, in the United States, it's not quite the same, because uh, for the most of my life, I've been speaking with American accent. I've been trying very hard to adapt into the society. But then in the end, I realized that I'm really different. I'm Chinese, I'm not American. So I have different ideas, my identity is quite different. So I decided to change my accent at some point to establish this identity that I'm, I'm different. I, don't, I wouldn't try to just be as you anymore. And then suddenly people find out, oh, interesting, where are you from? Man? What's your story? And suddenly it, gets, it makes me closer, ironically or sarcastically, in a surprising way. So that's also very interesting, I think. Um, I think so in order to adapt, you just have to do actual things. You just have to keep an open mind that you make sure that you actually think you want to. And I think if you make the effort, um, you know, people are more alike than different. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, the film which people probably saw from uh, Rebecca Nelson Mandela, and there's a very poignant scene in it where he goes to meet the, the oppressors, the Afrikaners. And he learns Afrikaans, and it was a very, very tense situation. I don't know if anyone has seen the film. Um, he, he just diffuses the, the, it's a very emotional scene, he diffuses the entire scene by speaking Afrikaans. But they were in tears on the, on, the, on the screen, and I was in tears watching the film. It was a very emotional scene. Yes? Excuse me, Tony, I'm yeah. chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a follow-up comment. It's really interesting what you said about... Um, I can't remember exactly what you said. But, uh, just a little, <laughs> the, I remember, can't remember the words you were using. Uh, just about um, the training that I've received for French was very much had an emphasis on being polite. And even with things like to faire les bises, to, to greet someone with the cheek kisses, they were, they were very big on, okay, don't do it unless the French person comes towards you and does it first. Uh, and so now I'm still in such a mode from my French training that you know people come and they're friends of mine or they're a little kid or you know someone I feel close to and they I'm still sitting here waiting for them to approach me. Uh, so I think that's and then they interpret that as um, me wanting to put distance in between me and them when really I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing in the first place. Um, so I I think that's something to be considered in education of language is that. Okay, yes, you need to teach people how to be polite, but also teach them how to make that transition into friendship, because in a lot of these language programs, it's for people who are trying to, uh, you know, integrate into a new culture or go to a new country, and if the only emphasis is on being polite and being correct and not on how to, you know, transition into friendship, that's something I haven't seen considered as much, so that made me think about, about that. Interesting point, yes. I just want to comment on that because that, that's really great. Um, I, I think you mentioned beliefs, Dragos, and, and what I found um, when they teach us like do this, don't do this, they don't tell us why. They, they don't tell us what it means for this culture to do or not do those things. And I think if we, you know that saying like know the rules so you can break them, it doesn't apply when you say like don't ever do this. 
do this instead and you don't know why. So I think that knowing why then helps you play around with those rules a little bit and still feel kind of confident because you know the territory better. So. Yes. What's the mask? So going with that, I am the children of Indonesian immigrants to the United States and um, ever since I was a little kid, something we Indonesians aren't allowed to do is get angry in public. That's one thing. Um, another thing is you're not allowed to la yell, obviously you respect your parents, all that. A big thing is you're not allowed to touch people's heads. Now, I had no idea why. And then a couple of years ago, I was in my college in New England Conservatory, which is a music school, and here's this book saying how to do business with people from other, uh, other countries. Now, the average Westerner will say, oh my God, this is all racist stuff, don't read it, it's whatever, propaganda, no, 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 this is all important. So what I didn't realize was whenever my parents were pinching my leg in the car because there was a guest in there because I was arguing with my sister, it was because in Indonesian society, if you get mad in public, it shows you have no self-control. Things like that. The other thing, touching the head, that comes from India. In India, your soul sits here, and your feet are the dir dirtiest thing on your body, because dirt, duh. So, so when you go to people's houses, that's why you take off your shoes, that's why you're not allowed to point. So for instance, in India and in Indonesia, a lot of Southeast Asian countries don't point at things with your feet. It's very disrespectful, because the dirtiest thing. Uh, what else don't you do? Uh, there's just a lot of things, and, and I think if you inquire of people, they will tell you. But of course, being an immigrant child, you're being a rebellious kid and you don't really care about tradition, right? Correct me if I'm wrong later, but. No, you're right. But, sure. yeah. I think. Yeah. The Atma sits here and then all that, yeah. Uh, there should be one other thing that I'm trying to remember. So I don't have yeah. to touch your head? <laughs> no, you're actually not allowed to. Uh, you can touch kids' heads, but you can't touch someone who's older than you. <laughs> they wouldn't give you permission to touch their head. No, no, no. I mean, you are not Indonesian, so it's okay. It wouldn't, it wouldn't mean anything. These are just cultural things, and so, yeah. I mean, Indonesians won't tell you directly. Let's say you move to Indonesia and you start learning Indonesian, they won't tell you that because they just go, "Oh, he's a foreigner. It's okay." You know. So you have the foreigner get out of jail free card. But for us. Yeah, it's, this, these are just interesting things that, that I as a child did not understand and refused to agree with because why is my dad pinching my leg in the car because I'm fighting with my sister? I'm fighting with my sister, we all do that. Who hasn't fought with their sibling? <laughs> Except if you don't have a sibling, and that's a different story. Okay, thank you. Is there someone else who wants to add something? Maybe one last comment? Yes. I think one, one important and interesting point that we haven't touched upon is the, the cross-cultural dating and relationship thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's our talk for the category that's, 2017. Yeah, right, that's our next talk. Cross-cultural dating. Yeah, so, um, so we, we talked a lot about uh, the cultural conflicts and misunderstandings and all that. I, I think cross-cultural or intercultural dating is, is one of those big sources of misunderstandings and conflicts because there's a lot of mis uh, faux pas and relationships and, and yeah, what not. I mean, I, I think I can I can deliver a talk on this. If, yeah, why not? Yeah, but that's uh, somehow, that's one thing that I thought it hasn't been discussed, so I just brought it to the table. Yeah, I mean, a couple will fight in their own language, so much more in other languages. Yes, please. Uh, just one, one thought. Kind of what you said in, in the whole of the talk is that when you're learning a language, you're learning a culture. But all of the resources and all the concepts that you mostly have been exposed to are about skills for learning a language, not skills and techniques and drills and practices and try this, try that for learning a culture. And the only thing I would suggest is anthropology is the academic field which studies culture. And maybe if you want to find answers, look there. Yes, I mean, for, for me, I, I would maybe... Uh, okay, I'm a bit of a history freak, so I, would, I, I love the history of maybe, let's say, Persia, or the Ottoman Empire, or my own history, I find it fascinating, the history of Romania. So, there you can find so, a sort of also... Um, attachment to the culture by knowing where they come from why is that they do that 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I look in history, but as you said, anthropology is also a big resource. So, I, I oh, one minute, okay, yes. I don't know, oops, if you've been to, um, if any of you has been to um, the conference in October in New York, Alex Vera talked about a similar thing, about third culture kids. He is American, and he was brought up in Austria, speaking English at home, but German. And then when he went back to the States, he, was, he could speak the language, but he could not make friends because he didn't watch the same cartoons, so, and he has, I had this story. But he also said that people, third culture kids, have a lot, which surprised me, that they feel depression and they even, they feel very, very bad, which surprised me. I mean, I I, I, crisis. they feel frustrated. There is no inclusion with the the other people in yeah, uh, so it surprised me not because it, I, I thought, is that true? I mean, uh, it could be because, yeah, as you said, for example, they didn't watch the same cartoons. Yeah, he it's couldn't an, it, play with them. He couldn't. It's another. It, it. He could speak the language, but it was the way the way he was acting. It was different. So. Mm -hmm. You can see that and maybe say, oh, you're strange, so maybe we don't hang out with you. So yeah. this could happen, yes, of yeah. course. I think it depends on the country uh, where you come from. It's yes, it you depends know, on the country uh, you come from. What's your name? I don't remember the other Romanian. What's your name? As Serena said before, for example, with Romanians, uh, they're not very positively uh, considered in Europe. The same for Colombians, really? you know, so uh, at least in Spain. In Spain, uh, I have had a lot of experiences, like different experiences. Sometimes I say, ah, but the impressions that I get are not usually nice in Spain. Whereas in Germany, it's, ah, you're Colombian, so nice, it's exotic. But there are a lot of uh, immigrants from Colombia in Spain. And I think the same is with uh, maybe Romania in Europe. It's like sometimes you don't, unless like, except for places like here, you know, we are very multicultural, we accept each other. But I think it really depends, because I had a friend of mine who was uh, half German, half Spanish, and she was quite okay with her two identities. But uh, it really depends if one of your identities might be maybe a bit uh, a conflictive or in one country maybe bad, uh, badly considered, I think. Okay. Thank you very much for your... Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Danke für Mais.